So our next talk is going to be called Integrated Assessment of Global Mortality Risks, and we'll be joined by our Daniel Bressler. Daniel is a second year PhD candidate in the Sustainable Development Program at Columbia University in the city of New York. He is interested in global catastrophic risks, environmental economics, international relations, conflict, and dual use technologies. His PhD training is in economics with additional training in the natural sciences. Before starting his PhD, he worked as a management consultant for five years where he primarily advised CEOs and management teams of large companies. Please welcome Daniel. Thank you. All right, so as she mentioned, I'll be talking about integrated assessment modeling of global mortality risks, and in particular, uh, the DICE EMR model, which is a, a model I created. We'll hear more about that in a sec. So the motivation for this uh, comes from a quote from John Broom, who's one of the leading uh, sort of philosophers that studies climate. Uh, he says that climate and population are intimately linked. If we are to evaluate climate change adequately and assess policies that respond to climate change, we shall have to take account of changes in the world's population. So I sought to answer a few questions with this research project. So how can we use the economic tool of integrated assessment modeling to assess phenomena that pose significant global mortality risks? Under a business as usual scenario, which is 4.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, how will warming, uh, global warming affect human mortality and the level of human population? And what are the social welfare consequences of this? Okay, so not to bury the lead, uh, let me give you a preview of the finding. Uh, so I find that over the next 80 years, there's going to be 76 million uh, cumulative excess deaths. Uh, and by 2100, there's projected to be uh, 2.18 million yearly deaths. Uh, and these are through three channels, which I'll talk about in more detail in a second. Uh, the climate health response uh, through a, a higher murder rate and through a higher rate of intergroup conflict. Um, and then the social welfare impact. Uh, I expect that when we explicitly account for these mortality costs, the, the social welfare cost of climate change is going to triple. Um, so uh, the original model that I'm building off of only accounts for uh, uh, damages to economic output. When I add in these additional uh, mortality damages, I find that the total welfare cost triples. Okay, so let me take a, a, a sort of bigger step back um, uh, uh, to motivate this at an even higher level. So as, as uh, we mentioned, I'm primarily trained as an economist. Uh, economists really focus on changes to GDP and consumption, but they usually don't think as much about changes to population. Um, they do produce tools that are practical uh, and are relevant for policymaking, such as the social cost of carbon. And these are three economists that all work uh, in climate change. Nick Stern, Bill Nordhaus, and Marty Weitzman. Um, in addition, uh, I'm quite interested in philosophy. Uh, I have a, a fellowship with the Global Priorities Institute, which brings together economists and philosophers to think about global priorities. And what I've noticed is that philosophers are quite interested in changes in population. There's a whole field on this, which is called population ethics. These are two philosophers that work in that field, uh, Derek Parfit and Nick Bostrom. Um, uh, what I've also noticed is that uh, Lots of times, philosophy is less practical, and it's concerned with hypotheticals. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's certainly exceptions to that, uh, but I think it's fair to say that economists, on the whole, probably have a larger influence on policymaking. So the goal of this project is to bring together uh, the sort of concerns of philosophy, uh, concerns about changes in population, and bring that into the practical tools uh, that are used uh, in economics. OK, so what is integrated assessment? So integrated assessment models summarize information from a range of disciplines uh, to assess complex phenomena that have coupled effects on humans and natural systems. Um, so there are tools to help decision makers understand complicated problems and to make optimal decisions. Um, so this past year, uh, Bill Nordhaus uh, won the Nobel Prize primarily for his work on integrated assessment modeling. Um, so climate integrated assessment models integrate climate change into long run economic analysis. Uh, they determine the social welfare cost of emitting carbon. Uh, and Bill Nordhaus uh, pioneered uh, integrated assessment modeling when he developed the DICE model, which stands for Dynamic Integrated Model of Climate and the Economy. And this was first developed in 1992. OK, so my model is an extension to this model. Let me talk about how these types of models work and how my extension works. Uh, so this right here is integrated assessment modeling in a nutshell. Um, so as you can see, there is a model of the uh, economy, of economic systems, combined with a model of social welfare, combined with a model of climate. So let's take a slightly deeper dive uh, with, with, with some math here. Um, so let's start with the economy here in the bottom left uh, corner. 
Um, so there's a projection of the amount of GDP that's produced, which is a function of capital, labor, total factor productivity. Uh, the economic agents in this model choose how much to save, and then there's investment, more investment leads to a higher GDP in the future, but they also need to choose how much to consume. And when they consume, this affects welfare. Uh, so the average welfare in the economy uh, in this model is a, a, fun a utility function, which is a function of consumption. Uh, then you multiply this by population, you multiply this by a welfare discount rate, you uh, aggregate this across time, and you get this social welfare function. Um, so the bottom two uh, uh, areas or you know, systems on this graph, uh, the economy and, and welfare, together, if you just ignore the climate piece for a second, uh, these bottom two systems make sort of the standard neoclassical growth model in economics. So what Bill Nordhaus did was that he added on this additional system, which is the climate system. So the economy affects the climate because uh, there's a certain level of emissions, uh, some fraction of economic output, uh, or, or, or some uh, uh, fraction that might change over time uh, uh, in terms of how much emissions there are per unit of GDP. So that affects global average temperatures. But then what happens is that as the world gets warmer, there's damages to the levels of economic output. So there's a feedback system uh, between uh, the economy and the climate. So at a very high level, this is basically how the DICE model works. Um, but I think there's something missing with this model. Um, so the world population stays the same regardless of if there's one degree of warming, two degrees of warming, or 10 degrees of warming. Um, so does this make sense? Uh, there's a lot of recent literature that suggests probably not. Uh, the, this uh, review article uh, in The Lancet suggested that climate change is the biggest global uh, health threat of the 21st century. So let's dive a little more into some of this literature. Um, so this right here is a projection of uh, the effect that climate change is likely to have on, uh, day, on different types of days. So the, the number of very hot days, of sort of hot days, and of col colder days. So this is the average for the whole world. Right now, uh, the, the, the bin uh, with the highest number of days in the bin is this 28 degrees Celsius. Uh, and there's not a lot of super hot days that are over 33 degrees Celsius. Um, but then, under this scenario, this is about 4.5 degrees Celsius of warming in 2100, um, the number of hot days is expected to really skyrocket. Uh, days over uh, 30, uh, between 28 and 33 degrees Celsius, and then over 33 degrees Celsius. There's going to be a lot more of these really hot days. Uh, and then we can see that this happens both uh, in warmer places as well as slightly colder places. So India, which is already uh, a fairly hot place, the, the most common day is between 80 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, and there's very few uh, days currently that are over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, under this scenario, there's going to be uh, a lot more very hot, hot, hot days that are over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's going to really increase quite a bit, as you can see here. Um, in the United States, uh, we see something similar. So right now, there's very few days that are over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but in, in, if we uh, expect this climate scenario to happen in the future with 4.5 degrees Celsius of warming, there's going to be a lot more days that are over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So what's the effect of this? Uh, so fortunately, there's been a lot of empirical literature that has looked at this uh, over the last few years. This is just, uh, uh, just a snippet, all these uh, uh, citations here of this literature. Um, so let's uh, uh, look at some of this. So this is from a paper from 2011 uh, by DeShane and Greenstone. Um, and uh, it looked uh, at the United States at the effect of different types of days on the overall mortality rate. So what this means is that if there's one of those really hot days, which is over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, we would expect there to be an additional death per 100,000 uh, uh, over the course of a year relative to a, a more mild day that's 50 to 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And you can see colder days have a, a mortality effect, but there's a super uh, large pronounced uh, mortality effect over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a, a more recent study by uh, Fu et al. Uh, from 2018 that looked at the effect uh, in India. So as you can see, uh, with there's a ver if there's a very hot day, 40 degrees Celsius, uh, the odds of mortality go up significantly. Uh, and we see this happen in uh, both uh, middle-aged people, 30 to 69 years old, as well as older people, so across the, the demographic spectrum. Okay, so that's the health effects of climate change. Um, there's been other uh, mortality effects of climate change uh, that have been um, 
uh, 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 surveyed in the literature that have also found significant effects. Uh, so uh, there's effects from interpersonal violence as well as from intergroup violence. Um, so this uh, image right here is from a, a big uh, meta review paper that came out in 2013 by Shang, Burke, and Miguel. And they reviewed uh, 60 different studies that looked uh, at the effect of temperature on conflict. Um, and they found uh, a very overwhelming uh, uh, consistency across all of these studies that increased temperatures have a significant effect uh, on the uh, uh, rate of conflict. Uh, interpersonal conflict, so this is in the top left corner, corner here, this is violent personal crime on rapes, uh, on uh, even at, at higher levels, civil wars, uh, political leader exits. Um, uh, so the, uh, they conducted yeah, all, all 60, 60 studies, and they found that out of the 27 modern studies uh, that looked at uh, the effects of temperature on uh, conflict, 27 of those studies found that an increase uh, in, in temperatures uh, resulted in an increase in conflict. Uh, so a significant effect uh, uh, from this meta review. Okay. So let's go back to the DICE model. This is the, the high-level overview of DICE that I showed you before. So there's a question. We talked about these health damages. Uh, are health damages included in DICE as it currently exists? So in theory, uh, some of these non-market damages, which includes uh, uh, health damages, are supposed to be implicitly included uh, within this damage function uh, through a, a method which is called value of statistical life. Um, However, the degree to which this is, inclu is, is included in this damage function is very hard to know without actually looking at the individual studies that were surveyed in order to create the damage function. So there's 26 of these studies, um, uh, and it, it's sort of difficult to know what's included without really digging into them. So what I did is I looked at the studies that received the most weight, and I tried to determine, OK, how much uh, are mortality costs included in those studies? And what I found was that some of the studies didn't include mortality costs at all. Some of them included them to a small percent. Uh, out of the most heavily review or the, the most heavily weighted studies in the review, uh, none of them accounted had had uh, health damages that were over 10 percent. So what I concluded was that there's likely less than five percent of of this damage uh, is made up of the health damages. Uh, so the answer to this question is yes, but to a very small amount. Uh, a much smaller amount than the recent empirical literature would suggest. Okay, so how do I uh, deal with this issue? So what I do is I add an additional system uh, to DICE. So DICE was climate, economy, welfare. This is largely the same as it was before, but then I add this other system, which is demographics. So human population uh, is, is a function of births and deaths uh, annually um, that determine uh, population, and then there's a uh, mortality response uh, such that higher average temperatures are going to affect the mortality rate. So that's why this model is called uh, uh, DICE with an endogenous mortality response. So that's EMR. Um, so now let's get a little bit under the hood a bit more looking at the map. So what happens is that everything is largely the same as before with climate, economy, and welfare, but now uh, the uh, crude death rate is affected by the average temperatures through those three channels that I just uh, talked about. We'll go into more detail about how I do that. And now, this population level is a function of the amount of temperatures uh, in, the, uh, in the economy. Um, so uh, uh, the, this is going to have downstream effects on the uh, GDP, because labor uh, is a determinant of total GDP. Um, it's also going to have downstream effects on welfare, because population is a key determinant of the amount of welfare in the system. Okay? So, how do, uh, uh, so as I mentioned before, I take uh, the rest of the DICE model as given, but I just add in this endogenous mortality response to isolate the effect. Um, so how do I do this? Well, I use uh, sort of an opportunity cost of life methodology. So uh, I define the value of life as the utility that an agent receives while living. Um, so the welfare costs from higher mortality are accounted for by considering the opportunity cost of that life. Um, so higher mortality leads to lower total social welfare um, from the opportunity cost of those who could have been alive to enjoy their utility if they didn't die of, as a result of this climate-induced mortality. So as I mentioned, this value of statistical life that's commonly used in the literature, it's useful uh, when excess deaths are small and the feedback effects on the rest of the economy are trivial. Um, but here, the feedback effects are uh, uh, larger. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's go to the methods. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this section quickly. Uh, I'll have a working paper up 
uh, in the relatively near future, so you can go into this in more detail. Um, so there's a standard way of calculating how population uh, 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 changes over time, which is a function of birth rates and death rates. Um, I take that as exogenous. I use projections from the United Nations. Um, so uh, this, these are brand new numbers. These actually came out four days ago, so I've had a fun time updating this model over the last few days. Um, but anyway, these are the projections of the crude birth rate into the future and the crude death rate into the future. So there's a demographic transition that's happening that's expected to continue uh, as people choose to have fewer children, as the world gets healthier and wealthier. Uh, but then there's going to be a slightly higher crude death rate because the world is aging. Uh, and with an aging population, the crude death rate goes up slightly. And here is the projected about 10.9 billion uh, people by the end of the, uh, end of the century. OK, so I'm not going to derive this. You can look at the appendix of my paper. But essentially, I'm trying to understand through these three channels, how is uh, the, the level of population going to be affected uh, through the mortality rate? So there's a health response, a murder response, and an intergroup conflict response. OK, so let's start with the health channel. So I conducted a review of the, of the literature to, to try to find estimates of, for different temperatures, what is the expected increase in the crude death rate. So then what I did is I ran an OLS, quadratic regression, just trying to uh, estimate uh, how uh, sort of the, the response function for how the crude death rate uh, uh, responds to increases in average temperatures, uh, as you can see here. Uh, then I project a new crude death rate. So it goes up goes up slightly. Uh, doesn't look like a huge amount, but we'll see the overall. Well, we've already slightly seen the overall consequences of this. Uh, we'll go to, into this in more detail in a second. Um, OK, now the, the murder channel. So what I had to do was establish murder's gross of the climate effect. So I projected the murder rate going to 2100. Uh, this is from uh, global burden of disease data. It's the yearly murder rate per 100,000 people. It's been going down slightly. Um, so I project that this continues into the future. Uh, so that's the, the bottom line here, gross of climate change. And then I use uh, Sean, Burke, and Miguel. I use their meta review um, to uh, look at the effect of warming uh, on the uh, mortality rate through the murder channel. They project that for every standard deviation increase in average temperatures, uh, there's a 3.9% increase uh, in the rate of interpersonal violence. And I, I project that onto the murder rate here, as you can see. OK, and finally, the intergroup conflict channel. Uh, this one was, uh, is, is sort of the hardest to do and the hardest to estimate. And the reason is that the uh, mortality from intergroup conflict or from war uh, is, is varies a lot over time. It sort of follows a power law distribution. So you can see during the height of World War II, the mortality rate uh, was 200 per 100,000 people from conflicts. Today, it's under two. So it's really sort of the outliers, these big, great power wars, world wars, that really affect uh, the death rate through conflict. Um, so what I do is I say, OK, over the last 27 years, there's been an average of 1.72 deaths, and I just project this going forward. So this is probably a gross underestimate. Uh, it's a conservative assumption, but there's still a pretty big effect with this conservative assumption. Um, we'll talk more about uh, this in, in detail uh, later. Um, and then what I do is I use uh, Sean, Burke, and Miguel again. They conducted a meta review uh, of 30 studies that specifically looked at, looked at uh, intergroup conflict. Um, and they found that for every standard deviation increase in average temperatures, uh, the frequency of intergroup violence increases by 13.6%. OK, so then this is uh, the, the bottom line is gross of climate change, so without the, the effect on intergroup conflict from warming. And then the blue line is with climate change, so the, the rate of intergroup conflict. Um, so it increases significantly in percentage terms. But because I took this you know, fairly, you could call it conservative approach uh, to estimating the uh, gross of climate cha change mortality rate, um, by the end of the century, it's only 4.72 per 100,000, even with this warming response. During World War II, it was 200. During the Rwandan genocide, it was, uh, it was 10, which was a bit of an outlier uh, on the previous page here. This is the Rwandan genocide. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, there's good reason to think that this could be an underestimate. But uh, the effects are still going to be pretty large, as we'll see. So this is the full uh, effect on the crude death rate. So now let's look at the results. So you already saw this, uh, this slide from the beginning. So I project that there's going to be 76 million cumulative excess deaths but over the next 80 years. In the year 2100, uh, I expect that there's going to be uh, 2.18 uh, million excess deaths in that year. M m most of them are coming through this uh, health channel. Um, uh, uh, the top, the green here, is the intergroup conflict channel. And then the red is the, the higher murder rate.
Um, so then this is the effect on the overall population. Uh, the population is projected by the UN without accounting for climate is close to 10.9 uh, billion, billion, and then uh, with the climate effect, it's closer to 10.8 billion. Okay, so then this is the economic effect. So originally, in the DICE model, he looks at the damage of climate to levels of economic output. So that's accounted for in these blue bars here. But then the red bars are the additional damage to economic output that comes from uh, the mortality effects, right? Because uh, the labor force is one of the, the determinants of uh, uh, overall ec economic uh, production. So with a slightly lower labor force, you'd expect slightly lower output. Uh, still much smaller than the effect on output levels, uh, but, but non-trivial and, and significant. Uh, so again, this is the overall welfare effect. So the present value over the next 500 years of the social costs of climate change, uh, we expect that to triple uh, when we account for these mortality damages, as I've shown you over the course of this presentation. Okay. So next steps. Uh, as I mentioned, there's good reason to believe that uh, the way I have chosen to model intergroup conflict could be a significant underestimate. So what I might be able to do in the future is do some stochastic modeling uh, uh, with, with some you know, underlying probability of great power conflict that might be increased by climate and see how that uh, affects uh, uh, mortality through inter intergroup conflict. That could be something I could do. One thing I have to do uh, that I will definitely do is that I need to determine uh, an optimization. I need to optimize this whole model to determine a well-defined social cost of carbon. Uh, this is what's commonly used in, in, um, uh, in, in policy. It says for every additional ton of carbon dioxide you release, what's the full present value of the, uh, uh, of the damages of that ton of carbon? Uh, so I will do this. Uh, uh, over, over the next few months. Uh, and something else to do is add in uh, the air pollution co-benefit of climate policy. So uh, many of you might not know this, but air pollution, which is mostly particulate matter, is actually the leading health risk factor in the world. It's even higher than smoking. So uh, on this graph here, uh, you can see that particulate pollution, on average, uh, uh, reduces life expectancy uh, by 1.8 years. So it's significant. Um, so uh, uh, combining this with, with a recent paper that came out two weeks ago uh, could be a good uh, thing to do. Uh, and then finally, something else I could do is model other global catastrophic risks, um, uh, such as pandemics or nuclear war. So what might this look like? Here's an example uh, of how you might use this methodology to think about a pandemic. Um, so uh, integrated assessment models are useful for assessing impacts and systems with coupled economic, demographic, and environmental effects. Um, so there was uh, a recent exercise uh, that uh, occurred uh, uh, last year by the John Hopkins Center for Health Security, where they projected if there was an engineered pathogen uh, uh, created by a terrorist group, uh, what might some of the global effects of this be? So they projected that there's 150 million global deaths, GDP decreased by 50%, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell by 90%. Um, so this is, uh, you know, a pandemic is an example of another type of phenomenon, a global catastrophic risk that has significant mortality effects in addition to economic effects. So this could be an area where using this type of integrated assessment modeling, uh, especially now that, that I've created this methodology for uh, accounting for changes in population, uh, that could be uh, something that could be useful. So this is just a, a, a sketch. I haven't done any of this yet uh, of what this might look like. So the contagious disease has effects on demographics. It has some profile, uh, re reproduction rate, uh, case fatality rate. Uh, it affects demographics through, a, you know, you could have a standard disease model, what's called an SIR model. Um, and then this is going to have effects on the economy, economy through low, lower labor, labor force. Maybe people will stay home because they're worried about contracting a disease. Could have effect on international trade if borders are closed down. And all of these things are going to feed into each other. And then if you imagine the economy is going to contract by 50%, uh, that will have significant effects on climate. Um, so uh, yeah, so all of this will be significant uh, for all of these different types of systems. OK, so finally, uh, I'm wrapping up. Uh, I provided a framework for better using the integrated assessment tool from economics to deal with phenomena that have large mortality impacts. Um, in the uh, 2100, under a 4.1 uh, degree Celsius warming scenario, I project 2.18 million additional yearly deaths due to climate change uh, and 76 million cumulative deaths. And then I find that explicitly accounting for climate change triples the social cost of climate change compared to just accounting for damages to output levels. Um, so thank you. Our discussant for this section will be Phil Trammell. Uh, Phil is a junior researcher at Oxford's Global Priorities Institute, exploring ways to 
apply the tools of economic theory to questions of long-term importance. He has served in economics research roles at the University of Chicago, NIRA Economic Consulting, and the Cato Institute, and he holds degrees in economics and mathematics from Brown University. Please welcome Phil. Hi, yeah, thanks a lot for this, Danny. Thanks. Um, I think it's uh, really um, well done and uh, you know, useful extension of the DICE model to incorporate something that's been far too long neglected by economists, and that, of course, we care about here, namely the effects on population. Um, just uh, because we don't have a ton of time, uh, I just was wondering if um, you could respond to a few, a few quibbles that I had when, when looking through the paper. Um, but instead of you know showering you further with, with praises and stuff, um, let's jump right to it. So on the slide where you introduce um, the uh, studied relationship between temperature and the murder rate, um, you you show what is uh, present in the Xiong, Miguel, and Burke uh, uh, paper, which is that what they study are temperature anomalies, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they they don't study the effect of slow, gradual changes on, you know, in temperature on a region on the murder rate in the region. They say if there was a particularly hot summer, the murder rate was a bit higher. And that seems quite different from the case that, that we face when we're projecting you know, a slow climate uh, change over, over a century, right? If it's a matter of people being um, sort of, yeah, responding to anomalies, that, that, that seems like quite different. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So the, the Sean Burke Miguel, they looked at uh, studies that were across a range of time scales. Uh, so some of them were over shorter time periods, some of them were over much longer time periods. Okay. And they, they found similar effects. But I, I think that's a, a, a good point, though. And, and I think, in general, more, more literature on the, uh, the effect of climate and conflict is probably useful. Is that, that, is, that, that paper's now five or, five or six years old. There's a recent paper that just came out in Nature, uh, but it wasn't really a statistical analysis the same way that, that was. But yeah. Yep. OK, and uh, finally, um, uh, to my understanding, your estimate of the cumulative excess deaths due to climate change um, just takes the crude death rate from Nordhaus and then adds in the, or maybe it's from the UN. It's from the UN, yeah. It's from the UN, yeah. But Nordhaus uses it in DICE. Yeah, he uses an older version, but okay. yeah. I mean, the new one came out like four days ago. <laughs> yeah. Right. But it, so it takes those numbers and then it adds in um, the m uh, mortality effects mm -hmm. from the three causes, so from ill health. Uh, interpersonal and intergroup conflict as if they were additively separable. Um, but of course, when the population is smaller due to one cause, you know, like if it's like a 10% shock followed by a 10% of the remaining 90% would leave 81% of the population remaining, so it would be a 19% uh, cumulative. Yeah, damage. so the, the way that the, the uh, functional form is structured of my equation, that's the, yeah. yeah, so you'd have to go to the appendix of my paper, but it, it accounts for that because there's, there's, it, yeah, so there's this, the health response goes directly into the crude death rate, but then the uh, murder response and the intergroup conflict response are, are then modeled separately using that baseline that I projected. Right. Yeah. So, so they're, they're, they're not uh, directly affecting uh, the crude death rate. They're added on after the fact, and then you can recalculate the overall crude death rate uh, after you incorporate for these two things separately. Um. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, we, we can talk about it. Yeah, we can talk about it. Yeah, detail, it's possible I, I made a mistake, but uh, I think yeah, we can, it's in the appendix yeah. of, the, of the paper. Yeah. yeah. Okay, in any event, um, on the whole, I think it would be great if um, this sort of methodology were applied to more importance of, more questions of long term importance, such as uh, pandemics, and uh, I'm glad to see more steps in that direction. So, thank you. Great, all. thank you. Okay, so we have time for one quick question. Um, and so, Daniel, I think you touched on this on your talk, um, but one audience member asks, does temperature systematically affect birth rate as well as death rate? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, so, yes. Um, though the reason why I don't specifically model it uh, in this uh, paper uh, is that it's not exactly clear of what the direction of that's going to be based on the empirical literature. So there's actually... Uh, well, I, I won't pull it up, but it, it's in my appendix. There was a, a, a paper from a few years ago uh, by Bereka and Deshane uh, and Gouldy uh, um, that looked at the effect of temperature uh, on the birth rate, um, and they found that there was actually a significant, as temperatures increase, there's actually a, a significant decrease in, in birth rates. 
But on the flip side, when there's higher mortality uh, and there's a higher rate of people dying, uh, there's also empirical literature in a number of different contexts that suggests uh, that there's going to be a higher birth rate to sort of replace the people uh, that died when there was a disaster. So these are kind of two different effects that go in different directions. Uh, I only really wanted to uh, model uh, a, a phenomena where it was very clear from the empirical literature which direction the effect was. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's important to consider that, and that's something I, I, I should try to model and, and would love to model. Uh, I think what's the empirical literature is a little more clear. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Let's thank Daniel and Phil one more time. <laughs>